Great to be here. So you don't think I'm complimentary enough? Uh, not on air, no. no. Off air, you say all these things. That it's uh, kind of John and I just cringe, and then not knowing what's going to come out on air. Household, are you catching any of this? <laughs> yeah, we need funny. we need to be bailed out, <laughs> Eric. We're not. I don't know where this conversation. What's this going. we stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't dig this hole. <laughs> so, you but know. I need somebody to bail me out, John. <laughs> Nobody ever really knows what's said about them when they leave the room, unless you've planted a mic or a camera. Um, but so, in, in general, Eric, as you've known me for a dozen years. Uh, is the general dis decision when people talk about me that I'm a horrible, terrible human being <laughs> or more of a kind-hearted, generous person? I, th I, think, well, I think you're kind-hearted, but by no means are you snarky like our good friend <laughs> Senator Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> you, you went where I feared to go. <laughs> what do you mean feared? You let off the show by calling him snarky. Well, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he was. But I told myself before that, don't say that to Jason. Don't say it. And the first thing I said was accuse him of being snarky. You came yeah, right yeah. after him. That was good, though, Bill. That was good. Came right after him. Uh, Eric Halsorder is uh, on his way uh, out of the uh, House of Delegates in West Virginia. Uh, his yeah. future at this point uh, right now centered in the HVAC world. And who knows uh, what else? That's right. That's but right. Uh, I, I can assure you that if it is the HVAC world and you call Eric, cool air will be flowing on the hottest of days. <laughs> Boy, that's a, that's a nice <laughs> advertisement there. Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you, before we go into the meat of what we're going to talk about, our HVAC broke we have two, two it's two uh, zones so we again well it was upstairs and downstairs the upstairs unit and heat rises so the upstairs unit broke and it was one of those 102 degree days right you never realize just how much you depend on the air conditioning until it's not there and and you look at the thermometer the thermostat of course it was, it was only 78 which is what rob lives at all the time but no, it's but, as, but as the guy who lives in the you know the 70 68 70 degree um 68 yeah. you said you're like at 62 you told me no that's in the winter time yeah once you allow that humidity to build up then it's just like a swamp and it just gets hot it and does and it takes a while to get rid of it so Absolutely. my question actually along those lines this time of year Within these are my house is only two years old, so you know if it do, can you actually run the stuff too hard? Do you need to back it off on the on the really hot days? Depends on your uh, you know what your comfort level is. Uh, I tell people normal cooling is seventy four to eighty, and it's wherever you feel comfortable. You know? no, I mean, in terms of the maintenance of the unit itself, do they no. burn themselves out or anything? No. Okay. No, as long as you're keeping your filters clean, you know, once a month, you should be good to go. All right, so I'm if, going back to hanging meat. If I can go back to what Eric just said. <laughs> hanging meat, where does that go? <laughs> don't let him off the cold, head. cold in my head. Don't, don't ask him to get <laughs> into detail. He's an author. You don't know what's buried in that vault. Eric just said 74 to 80 is normal right. cooling. And, and my thermostat in the house is set at 74. John's is set at 68, he just said. Sleeping weather. Which, which, Sleeping would, which would imply to me that John's abnormal. Can we agree? Can we all agree that gill strap is abnormal based on what Eric just said? Based on temperature? No, no, everything. No, everything, everything you know everything, about yes, I would agree yes, to that. I agree everything that. that you know about him. <laughs> I agree to that. Temperature, <laughs> no he's exception. He's I think he's normal. Work. He's definitely helping the coal siren stacks. <laughs> <laughs> but in my family... Uh, I live in the 68 to 70 degree range. My wife lives in the 78 to 80 degree range. Well, the funny thing is you'll start to get acclimated to whatever that temperature is, and sometimes you may need to turn it down a little cooler just to feel cooler. So, you, I mean, your body reacts to it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. so. and, and the damage I do to the environment during the summertime, I make up for in the wintertime because I turn the heat off. Well, where you got to be careful <laughs> is electric companies sometimes, as they throttle back amperage, your voltage to your home that can cause uh, havoc on your compressors. Instead of having 240 volts to the compressor, that compressor may start to see 230 or less, and that's where you can get burnout conditions. So, Throttle back amperage would be a great name for a band, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, Eric, let's talk money sure. because uh, the state was basically break even for the first month of the fiscal year. We we spoke with Craig uh, Blair last week, the Senate yeah. president. He mentioned there was a slight surplus negated by the need to uh, transfer of some money. So effectively, it was kind of a break-even month, right? 
And I was a little disappointed, too, with the report. That's one of the things that I want to talk about. I don't understand the underlying reasons why someone made the key decision to, to do what they've done. But let's just talk about the big three right now. The big three is personal income tax, consumer sales tax, and severance tax. And if you look at the revenue collections for the personal income tax, we estimated $151 million. We brought in $42 million, oh, excuse me, $142 million. We were about $8, $8.9 million less on our collections. Now, this, this is where the report starts to change. Uh, for whatever reason, we were actually, uh, I guess our collections were even less, lesser. Uh, they were right around about $16 million less than what the actual report was generated because they decided, they being the uh, the budget office and revenue secretary, decided to make a withdrawal of $7 million out of the personal income tax fund and put it over into the collection side of the personal income tax, which negated us having a negative for the month. It actually gave us a positive of $4.9 million. Now, why they decided to do that, why did they decide to prop up this report and make it look good, I have no idea. I would rather that they had just reported the revenue collections as they were so we can have an actual, you know, number that we're dealing with instead of trying to prop up a report. But that's what they did for the personal income tax. Eric, so, excuse me, let me interrupt yeah. very quickly. Yeah. Uh, who, they being the, the governor's office or being the legislators or who? Oh, I would say it would be a combination of all three, the governor's office, the budget office, and the revenue uh, secretary. Someone made a decision, you know, hey, look, we have revenue uh, collections are, uh, are down for PIT. You know, let's go ahead and draw $7 million out of our personal income tax reserve fund. We've got, we need to make payments for uh, whatever refunds are coming out in July, which I really don't know how many refunds. You know, I think most businesses, they can uh, postpone their taxes until September, but I don't know why July. But anyways, they decided to pull $7 million out of the personal income tax reserve fund. The last time that was done was back during covid and they uh, put it in, into the collection side of this report to make the collection look like we missed our mark by eight million, eight point nine million. When in reality we missed our mark by sixteen million. Okay. Well, that's so, that's playing games and that, uh, it is cha playing games. challenging the credibility that we should have for the uh, our revenue reporting. Uh, I, and I agree with you, and that's why I'm disappointed. Now, consumer sales tax. Um, we estimated $94.7 million. We collected 92.6. So we were about $2 million low. No big deal. Severance tax, we estimated for the month of July, $4.4 million, and we collected $3.1 million. Now, the biggest underlying, um, I think, of why they did what they did was because of the severance tax. Uh, every quarter, we have a Cole County reallocation uh, that happens to 19 coal counties, and uh, that was about, I believe it was like uh, 3.3 million dollars that these 19 coal counties get a get an apportionment of the severance tax that's collected, and then also there is a 75% uh, uh, distribution to those same 19 uh, or yeah 19 counties, and then there's a 25% distribution that gets paid out to uh, a lot of counties and cities. And that's generally, and that's paid every quarter, and that's generally around $7.5 million. So I think the $16 million that we were possibly low on the personal income tax, they used to have to pay the, uh, the, the Cole County severance tax and the 75% and the 25% distribution. Does that make sense? It does, Frighteningly so. It's uh, yeah. I'm uh, I'm I'm really disappointed to hear that uh, uh, the games are being played to the level that you're talking about. Maybe I shouldn't well, be surprised, yeah. but I'm I'm disappointed to hear. I mean, I'm just I'm shocked, yeah. like everybody else. Yeah. Why would okay? Why not just report to us that your personal income tax was 16 million dollars low? I would have been fine with that. In the end, instead of having a four point nine million dollar surplus we would have been down around 2.4 or 2.5 i could have lived with that but um, anyways for whatever reason it was done that way it makes the report look like we have a surplus of 4.9 
And uh, moving forward, though, you know, the revenue, I heard you, you guys talk a lot about the revenue estimates. And uh, so just so your listeners know, the revenue estimates for the fiscal year 25 budget cycle that started July 1, the revenue estimates for that fiscal year 25 are $5,264,536,000. And then if you look at the, the cash flow, the general revenue cash activity report that's also projecting the expenditures for every month, we're um, projecting like four billion eight hundred and seventy-seven million nine hundred and eighty thousand dollars is how much we're going to spend over the next year. Okay, that leaves a projected surplus of uh, three hundred eighty-six million, and then if I add the natural growth of revenue to that of about a hundred and fifty million dollars a year, I'm projecting that the that the fiscal year twenty-five surplus. And you want to write this down so we'll see how close I am here next June. But I'm projecting that our surplus is going to be around $536,556,000. So in order to achieve that, we're going to need to hit about $49 million of surplus every month. Eric Kalsoder on this date, August 5, projects a 536, that's interesting, $536.5 million surplus for next year. And Eric, that, that, is that uh, taking into account the four percent trigger for a tax cut? It does. It does. Now, how about the nine percent the governor wants to do? Uh, no, no, I'm not even factoring in. I, from all indications, I don't even know if that's even going to get across the finish line. So let's just assume that we're going to get our four percent trigger, and um, and move on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. How would how, you how would you vote on the other nine percent? I would probably support it, but uh, I would want to make sure that there are some things. I know I've heard President uh, Blair several times on your on your radio station uh, talk about certain liabilities. Uh, I would make sure that I would sure up those liabilities by taking this surplus that we have, this $600 million surplus, and banking some of that money to cover those liabilities that, that he's concerned about or others are concerned about, and that's one of the ways to do it. Is it – the extra income, the governor's proposed extra income tax uh, cut, is that a irresponsible thing to do, a less than responsible thing to do? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's doable if you, and, and I've mentioned this before, with this surplus, this projected surplus, if you were to take $200 million off the table and park it into that personal income tax reserve fund, I believe you could do it very well, very easily, okay? But um Go ahead. But and I, I believe Craig said, Craig Blair said that that would then take teacher five percent increases, five percent teacher pay increases off the table, right? He mentioned that, but keep in mind once again, you know the way that the trigger system is is developed, you can have up to five percent spending per year. Five percent spending is about two hundred and some million. And you've heard me mention this time and time again. There's about a natural growth in revenue of about $150 million. And we're even seeing our own government use that in their revenue estimates because I just mentioned that our revenue estimates for fiscal year 25 was $5,264,000,000. Well, last year, our estimated revenue estimates were five million one hundred and, or excuse me, five billion one hundred and twenty million. It was a difference of about $143 million. So that follows that natural trend of about $150 million a year just in natural growth and revenue. So you could conceivably do one more pay raise, um, and I don't see that, that there would be a problem. But once again, your last segment, I think you, you touched on this, is government spending. I know, Bill, you raised some key issues. John, you raised a lot of great issues. But that is the key if you keep your spending. With under the five percent, I think you should be able to do the extra five percent that the governor is asking for. Our guest is Eric Householder, and Eric has just predicted a five hundred and thirty-six and a half million dollars surplus for this upcoming uh, fiscal year. Eric, being is that you're on the way out, mm -hmm. right? You can freely state a few things that others who are looking for re-election can't. For instance, if you're Hoping to be reelected, the odds of you opposing a uh, a lesser tax break uh, probably uh, pretty strong because you're running for reelection. 
right? So you're you're going to want to go along with the biggest tax break possible heading into an election. You don't want to be known as the 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 delegate who said no, you only can have four percent and not nine percent. Do do you agree with that statement? And and do you think that your the, the folks you're leaving behind are fiscally prudent enough to understand the ramifications of four percent versus nine percent and what it might leave the new governor on the hook for? Uh, yeah, well, to answer that question, I do believe that people respect uh, others who will be truthful with them. So if, if you're going to tell constituents that, hey, look, we can't afford this tax cut, people understand. But what you can't say is we can't afford this tax cut and then increase your spending levels and do other things with it. That doesn't set well with, with uh, most constituents. But, uh, look, I, I found the best course of action is, is just to level with people. If you can afford a tax cut, and as long as you, that you don't have to raise taxes, people will understand. But uh, I, the biggest thing that we've got to decide as a legislature that I've been harping on it are what are their priorities? What will our priorities be? Is it education? Is it welfare reform? Or whatever that case may be, you've got to sit down as a legislature and decide what your priorities are. And that's what dictates how you spend the money. We had a conversation, uh, I guess it was last weekend when you were at my house, and we talked about uh, some of the obligations that the state has in regards to those in need. And you mentioned that, uh, and maybe you could explain this better uh, or more fully to our audience. Uh, we eliminated the waiting list in West Virginia, right? and that created a fiscal responsibility that the state now has to bear. What did that mean? Well, it's the IDD waiver list. In fact, you hear one of your co-hosts, uh, um, Michael Height, talk about it. Um, the governor, back in his first term, decided to clear the waiting list. We have a pretty um, um, general benefit when it comes to the IDD waiver program. And uh, so the governor, at, back in his first term, decided to clear that wait waiting list, and we brought more people onto the rolls when at the time what we should have done was uh, probably expanded the provider payments, which we've never done. So you see individuals like Mike Height, who's in this uh, business, you see them where they've been operating for the last 25, 30 years on such a small $20, I don't even know if it's $20 or what it is, but let's just say it's $20 for your listener uh, per hour rate, a reimbursement rate which in reality we probably should have increased that provider rate instead of increasing the roles to the IDD waiver program. And those are decisions that have to be made. If, if the legislature is deciding that we are serious about cutting taxes and that we're going to give money back to our constituents, then you've got to make a decision. What are the core principles or core things that you want to focus on and prioritize and spend your money on? Because you, you can't do both. When you say cleared the list, what does that mean? That nobody on the list got benefits or everybody on the no, list no, got no. benefits? Uh, so I'm making this number up because I don't know the, the exact number. Say we had 30,000 individuals that were already in the IDD waiver program. There could have been 10,000 more that was on the waiting list. So we took in those 10,000 and we, we, we cleared the list so there wasn't anybody waiting. So we increased the uh, the amount of people that are on that are in the IDD waiver program did that increase the number of people who moved into the state to get on that list so they could get benefits whereas they might not have in other states actually yeah you're bordering uh, states like Ohio Pennsylvania if if uh, our reimbursement rates are higher than those other states then obviously it's going to be more attractive uh, you know to have um, your, your children or, or your or an adult on the adult side it's the ADD program but um, yeah we I just think it was bad that we increased or cleared the waiting list when we probably should have increased the provider reimbursement rates yeah Eric I'm going to ask a question that's unfair and one that you probably <laughs> will not want to answer okay. uh, you've uh, over the years you have developed a I think a very impressive reputation of being both exceptionally knowledgeable and also uh, very frank and very open, and I, for one, appreciate that much. Uh, you also, uh, I think, have skills and experiences that would serve us well uh, in West Virginia in some role of the government. Uh, and also, I realize you have a very close relationship with, uh, uh, with, with Patrick Marcy, which uh, in all probability will be the governor. 
putting these together, if you have a choice, what role would you see Eric Householder playing in the next uh, next three or four years? I never gave it much consideration, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I've mentioned before that if I got a phone call from our next governor-to-be, if it is Patrick Morsey, we would have to sit down and have a conversation to see what role he would even consider me at. And uh, that we just would have to wait. Uh, right now, there's been no conversations to that regard. Uh, there has been none of that. And uh, But I mentioned before that, you know, I wouldn't mind helping out Patrick if I could. If, if he feels that there's a need out there for me, then, yeah, I'd like to sit down and talk with him and see what that need may be. Eat. No, go ahead, John. No, no go ahead. I was say each day I open up the Metro News webpage, Eric, and there seems to be a new piece about the governor on there. Yes. We've got the Greenbrier at the end of this month that's going to hit the auction block. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor is taking this as personal attacks against him generated by Democrats. Is there concern among the legislature about the governor of West Virginia's financial health? I just can't imagine what it's like, the stress level that he's under. It's got to be a huge stress level. But, yeah, like you and others, uh, I saw where, um, you know, the Greenbrier is supposed to be up for auction on the 27th of August. And, you know, we also have the, uh, the business summit is planned for that day. Uh, with the uh, West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be down for that. That's on the 27th. So will that happen on that day? Who knows? I've heard uh, rumors saying it, like you just mentioned, that it is just Democrats paying, playing politics. Uh, will the Greenbrier be sold? I don't know. But uh, it is disheartening that he's in this situation. I can't imagine. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I'm sure the stress level is very, very high. Yeah, I just I'm going to go back to the very beginning of yeah. of this discussion of the report on on the revenue and such. Um, are we playing fast and loose with facts? We we talked about the importance of truth in in politics, and then we talked about the the shuffling of numbers in in the reporting here. Is is that sleight of hand that should be concerning us? Well, what I'm disappointed about this is just a revenue collection. It's how much cash you're collecting each month. It doesn't talk about expenditures. So why do we have to bolster a PIT, personal income tax, just reduce it by $8 million just to bolster the report and make it look better? I mean, I'm just I – don't, I don't know why we're – why the decision was even made to do that just for this one month. And usually the funny thing is the month of July is usually one of the worst months. Uh, we have to uh, pull $70 million out of the rainy day fund for cash flow to get us started for the next – I just don't see why they decided to do that. You'd been better off just to report the numbers as they actually were, and then that way it doesn't cast any dispersion or doubt against you. So it just it makes you look bad when you decide that you're going to peg the report instead of actually reporting what the numbers are. So, Eric, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, greatly appreciated. See you, gentlemen. Have a great day. Thanks, Take care. Eric Householder at uh, 931.